A famous professor of forensic medicine, John Glaister, who practiced in Glasgow for 30 years, once said this, It is impossible for anyone to go to the scene of a crime without either leaving some trace of his visit behind him or carrying away, all unsuspectingly, some trace which links him with the place. It is just that unsuspecting trace which, in the last program of this series, led, after many ups and downs, to arrest, conviction and sentence. As in previous programmes, the police and the forensic people play themselves, while other parts are portrayed by actors. Michael? Michael, if you don't come now, I'm going to change my mind. Come here. If your father was here, I'd get him to bring the hell out of you. Now, go on. And get out of my sight. Okay, lads, now just before you go, I've got to remind you, Monday, the 22nd of December, we're going carol singing at the old people's homes. And I'd like you to bring, if you would, a small item of food, anything at all. All right? Okay? Right. Trip to alert. Right turn. There's Miss. What are you doing here? Look, there must be a simple answer. You know what you like, these lads. You probably met a pal of his and, and gone off with the sub money. Michael's not like that. Oh, all lads are like that. Sometimes they come up to me and they say, my dad's taking a pay next week or my mum's got no change. Anything. I'm sorry to bother you, Jack, but you haven't seen Michael, have you? No. Are you sure you haven't seen him? No, sure, you know, not in the street or anything Has he ever been missing from home before? No. Has he any pals at all that he might have gone to? Well, we tried them all. Tried them all, have you? Have we got a list yet of, of, of all his pals? Or can we draw this list up of well, all his mates at all? You know, because there might be just someone somewhere that can assist us. Well, I told the policeman. Everybody I could think of. That's right. What, what about his aunts, uncles, or...? Anything like that? Well, again, you know, I told them who he might have gone to, but he wouldn't have just gone. In the course of every day of every week, one gets dozens of missing from homes. But this one wasn't right. There was something seriously wrong. He was a lad who didn't go away from home. He was more a mother's boy. And the more you looked into it, you realised that there was something radically wrong from the word go. And in consequence, we track this as a major inquiry from day one. Michael Hodgson, 11 years of age, who lives in Granby 
Road and was last seen in this area wearing a Boy Scouts uniform and pale grey anorak. Have you seen Michael since yesterday? Who was he with? Has anyone seen him get into a car? Has he been picked up by anyone? Has he been talking to you about leaving home? Has he got any other problems that we don't know about? Well, out there, there are a lot of men searching. And at home, his mother sits pretty upset. Now, I want your help. This is the young man. He's called Michael Hodgson. He's 11 years of age. Have you seen any Boy Scouts at all playing in the no, area? No, not appear there. No, I never saw that boy. He says a home-loving sort of lad. Yes, he is. His mother keeps tight rein on him. Uh -huh. What about any strangers in the area? Last couple of days, have you seen anybody you don't recognise? No, I'm sorry, I don't know. By Saturday afternoon, we had gone 44 hours without hearing anything of this missing lad. We were getting desperately worried, and then the inevitable happened. He's definitely dead, Jack. Don't touch him, Mike. Can you mark that right off to the bottom, please? Go ahead, please. He's been well and truly strangled, John. He's got lots of petechiae. He's got a nice broad ligature mark. I should think the naked chief will do for that. The knock marks at the back, which fits in nicely with a bit of sexual how's your father. Got a fat lip, split freedom. I'll try and collect you a few bits and bats from this. Yes, well, anything around the neck would be useful. Yeah. Rigor mortis is complete. So is been dead 24 hours plus, possibly 36 which again there fits That's in with your right. idea That's that he's right. been dumped. It's been dumped here, yeah. yeah. And again, you see, look at the shape of him anyway. The Rigor's not right for being killed here. He's been That's in the right. boot of a car That's or right. something Absolutely. like that. And then he's just come a roller from the top. So, I don't think I can tell you very much else here. I'd have thought the thing to do is let's get him gloved up, bagged up, and get him off to the mortuary. OK. A wave of shock and revulsion at the murder of a young boy went through the population. The public were most helpful and most willing to cooperate throughout. That's always the case with a child murder, particularly if it may be sexually orientated. But we hadn't a lot to go on, and all we could do was to make thorough inquiries in the area of the boy's house and the scout's hut. We wanted to trace every man and every vehicle who had been in those areas at that time. My post-mortem examination confirmed that the boy had been a victim of serious sexual assault. We took some fluid from the eye and we measured the potassium level in it. As the body decomposes, the level of potassium in the eye fluid increases, and so this enabled us to roughly estimate the time of death. And he'd certainly been dead for uh, well over 24 hours, nearer 48. His stomach still contained the uh, undigested remains of the last meal that his mother gave him on the Thursday night and this confirmed that his death occurred within two or three hours at the most of his eating that meal. The only thing we have to go on is that he'd been a victim of a serious homosexual offence. As a result of that, I want this team to go out and to trace every known homosexual in this area, to visit the public toilets and places where cottaging and importuning for clients takes place, and to trace and thoroughly check every homosexual for his whereabouts during the five hours immediately following the time on Thursday when the Boy Scout left home. Let me say that any information that you have will be treated in the strictest confidence. In fact, I have authority to tell you that any statements made during the investigation or photographs, it may be necessary to take certain photographs, but they will be destroyed at the end of the inquiry 
and if necessary, uh, a member of your group can come and, uh, and supervise that destruction. What I want to get over is that we are dealing with a murder and nothing else. We found most of them very helpful. The vast majority are consenting adults, and like the heterosexuals, they don't uh, like the child molester. A lot of them came forward with some very useful information, made statements and had the photographs taken. Just sit there, please. If you can sit up straight and look straight towards the camera. It's fine. Thank you very much, Derek. Derek Griffin looked very promising. Just have a look at that. That's the boy we're talking about. Do you know him? Yeah, uh, a little bit. Well, they all look the same, really. His house was in the same street as the scout hut, and he admitted knowing Michael by sight. Have you ever been with any of those scouts? No. Are you sure? Yes, yes. Yes, I am. So you were found with a young boy in, in the car? He'd been found at midnight with a 12-year-old boy in a car very near the place where the body was found. But uh, I wasn't doing anything. Blood and saliva samples were taken from him. The boy was blood group O. Seminole staining was found on the back of his trousers and underpants. Tests indicated that it was left by a group A person. Derek Griffin was not a group A. Peter Gould had the right blood group. Where did he go? Black Bull. The Black Bull in town? Yeah. He was a teacher who had links with the Scouts. He confessed to officers of indecent assault on young boys. And you think he went there that night? Yeah. You sure about that? I think so. What time would he go in there? I got there about... Ten past eight. And where would you be before that? Was it Tom? Ian Gray had the right blood group. What time would you finish work that night? Six half past. Have you some transport? Yeah. He was seen approaching a small boy in an amusement arcade. They were followed to a public toilet and caught in the act. So what time would you arrive at home? Quarter to seven. Was anyone there when you got there? Yeah. Who's that? My mum. Your mum? Anybody else? No. I was particularly struck by a number of fibres which I had recovered from the boy's clothing and also from tapings from his bare flesh. These were quite different from fibres which I would normally associate with clothing. They appeared to be man-made, of similar length and thickness, and appear to have been cut straight across at each end. I associated these fibres with a process called flocking. Nylon is drawn out into long strands, which are then chopped into short lengths by a guillotine. They are then charged with an electric current and fired at a base material covered with adhesive. This process has numerous applications, including carpet making. As you can see, they're fairly coarse, and they have a characteristic end, which is clean, clean cut. cut yeah. The thickness of these indicates, really, that they could well be from carpet, carpet fibres. Can you say whether it meant he was killed on that carpet or whether he picked them up being transported after death to the colliery where he was dumped? No, I can't be so specific as that. But certainly, if we can eliminate the possibility that they've come from his house, then I feel that quite, these fibres are quite significant. All right. 
I'll get a team doing that, but can you help us? Can you narrow it down with colour or any, anything uh, that will help us to identify the sort of carpet we're looking for other than a dark coloured flock carpet? Black, but probably not totally black because there are a few light fibres. We don't actually know if all these fibres have come from the same item, the same carpet, if it is a carpet. I had to get two detectives of the meticulous type who would beaver away trying to find the particular type of flock carpet in which matched those fibres. The Forensic Science Laboratory were very, very reluctant indeed to release the fibres. This, we understand, was because of the fact that possibly we may have lost them or they may have become destroyed. We knew the precise dimensions of the fibres and we knew that they were black. And that's as much information as we had to go on at the beginning. We went round and traced everybody who had anything to do with nylon flocking. Any lead that you can help us on in the manufacturing that you're doing, are we on the right line to make fire? Anything you can tell us at all. Well, I don't think well, it's coming but... from this place. It's not coming from this factory. Uh... So we can eliminate this sort of on the right one, that's what we're looking for, the right one. What about importers? Well, Visco Swiss, I'm in Switzerland. Yeah. I'm not looking at it. While the police concentrated on finding the end product in which these fibres might have been used, I wanted to discover who had made the original filament. The diameter gives the indication that it's not an ICI fiber. That's interesting. Right, we'll do uh, a melting point and take it from there. Fine. A fiber was put on a hot stage and heated up. OK, and we'll take that up to melting point, which should be any minute now. And there we are. It melted at about 255 degrees centigrade, which indicated that it was an unusual type of nylon known as 6-6. After 10 days, we visited 30 companies. And after those inquiries, it was narrowed down to three companies that made black carpeting of the right dimensions. Only one of these companies used nylon 6-6. This was Flotex. It turned out that the only black carpet in the made was for British Leyland. British Leyland did use Flotex carpet in, in three of their models, the Triumph 2000, 2.5 and Triumph Stack. Furthermore, they only used that carpet for one year and then it was discontinued. This was exciting news because we felt now we were getting really close. We got all available police officers stopping and checking all P and R registered cars in the West Yorkshire area and taking samples of the fibre shed by those carpets inside those cars. Forensic science at this point released a certain number of fibres to us so we were now able to take the evidence to Flotex. Are you sure these are the right fibres, John? Yeah. All right. I think you've got problems. These fibres are blue, they're not black. No. You say they're what? They're definitely blue, they're not black. Come here, let's have a look now. Cool. Good God. This really kicked us in the teeth. Here we've been wasting hour after hour after hour tracing car after car after car in a black fibre and at the end of the day here we find the truth now when we've got it in vision the fibres were in fact blue. I've never felt as bad in my life. It knocked the stuffing completely out of me and I felt as though we'd come to the end of our tether.
were just stumped. It was just astounding. Uh, you don't know what, what to do after that. And uh, we did think again. At this stage, we had 120 men working on the inquiry, some around the clock. We were conscious of the cost, and we were running out of suspects. All of them were being eliminated, and we were getting nowhere. I wanted to tell you before, but I couldn't. Peter Hunt, a well-known male prostitute, had already been interviewed, but he came back in to see us. Go. I was there. I saw it all. It, it was my lover. Your lover? I saw my lover strangle the boy, and I was there when he dumped him. The wasteland had gravel on it, some sort of gravel, because I could remember hearing it under the, the wheels of the car. Well, keep your eyes peeled. Let's let me know if you see it. OK. Oh, hang on a sec. This, this might be it. Yeah, I think, I think this is probably it. What day of the week was it? It was a Thursday evening. Yeah, can't remember why. Mr Whitehouse, do you like little boys? What do you mean? You know very well what I'm talking about with little boys. Let's talk about Peter Hunt, for starters. I'm not answering any more questions until I've spoken to a solicitor. You know the road very yeah, well, seems yeah, to do Yeah, yeah, I know the road. Past. I know the road. I know the bloody road well. All right, I know the road, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. and we pulled off. We did not pull off. We weren't even road. bloody there. And you stopped the car. One was lying, which one we knew not. But it had got to the stage where they had been there for three days and we had either got to charge them or release them. I want to talk to Sergeant Townsend. OK. He admitted that he made the whole thing up. I was furious, quite frankly. Something like 400 man-hours had gone into this, and Silver were no nearer. The colour that fibres appear under the microscope depends on how they are lit. When they are lit from underneath, they are silhouetted and appear black. It is only when lit from above that they appear in their true colours. The ones I have recovered from the boy corresponded exactly to three Flotex colours. Dark blue, mid blue and grey. This combination was used in only one of their carpets, called Peacock. Peacock is a heavy duty floor covering used for hospitals and schools and canteens and offices. Not the sort of carpet that one would normally expect to find in a house. Right, just walk in now. Walk into the back again. When we identified the carpet, the problem was that 32 miles of it had been manufactured. We decided to trace every square yard of it. Fortunately, Flotex was a new company. They had extremely good housekeeping. There was a five-year guarantee with this particular type of carpet, and therefore every order was meticulously recorded. So it is important to have to love every moment. Yeah. Because in probably a few months' time. We're not suggesting for one minute that any of you are responsible for this murder. But what we are looking for is your cooperation, ladies and gentlemen, and we need it. We're trying to trace the offcuts, the bits that you might have taken home and used to line out the bathroom, the toilet, anywhere. Or you may well have sold the Flotex carpeting to some of your friends, got it cheap for them. It's that type of thing that we are looking for, the smaller amounts. We had to interview all the carpet fitters who had laid this particular type of carpet 
and we had to find out what had happened to all the offcuts from it. Well, usually we wasn't just wrapping together and dump them in a skip, yeah. chuck them out of the road. Have you ever had any offcuts from the carpet? No, not at all. Can you tell me what you did with those? Well, I, I fitted the car. It was just enough for the car, actually. You fitted your car? Yeah. And have you still got that car? No, no, I've sold it now. Do you know who to? Oh, blimey, um, no. But I didn't take the guy's name, he just answered an advert. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. Can you that. remember the registration number of the car? Uh, yeah, now then. G Golf, U Uniform, G Golf. 484 T Tango. Come on, Tomo, get stuck in. Good lad. Well, I manage a football team. Um, I'm a good manager, but I don't have anything like that to do with lads. I'm not a homosexual. Have you ever been married or live with a woman? No, I'm not that type of person, but I do have a girlfriend. He did indeed have a girlfriend, and I interviewed her at length. I also checked with the boys in his football team, but there was no evidence whatsoever to suggest that it was homosexual. Now, Andrew, I just want you to know the position. Your rough green trousers, fibres from those trousers have been found on the dead boy, identical fibres from your trousers on the body of the dead boy. Well, I'm sure I'm not the only person to own a pair of uh, green leather trousers. Uh, how do you know they're mine? Because also on the boy, were red fibres, and identical red fibres have been found on your trousers. That means that your trousers have been in contact with the dead boy. There must be some mistake. There can't be any mistake. The Forensic Science Laboratory have matched both the red fibres and the green fibres. They're identical in type, colour, material and every respect. I didn't do it. Go ahead and charge me if you think I did. How do you explain the two types of fibre being matched so perfectly? I can't. Here we had a man who was the right blood group. He had the right type of Flotex carpet fitted to his car. There were two other independent types of fibre evidence to link him with the boy, and yet he wouldn't cough. Look, Andy, Mr Holland's explained to you in great detail the evidence against you. And you must know that what he's saying is true. There's no question that you're responsible for killing that boy. But what must come out is why you killed him. I know you've been talking to a lot of people about me. But has any one of my team said that I've done anything wrong to them? Have you found anyone who said I was a homosexual? Because if you have, they're liars. You're right, nobody has said you're a homosexual. We've interviewed hundreds of homosexuals on this inquiry. And some of them are quite open about it. They've come to terms with the feelings. They can talk to the police about the tendencies. That's why you're different from many of them. Andy, I've just been to see your girlfriend, Maggie. Does she think I've done it? I've no idea. Whatever she thinks, she's still prepared to stand by you. Why did you have to see her? I had to ask her some questions. How 
Or did she take it? How do you think? Did she cry? Yes, Emily, she cried. Tony, I've just left him down there and he's wanting to speak to you on your own, so will you go down and see him, please? <laughs> A few months ago, I started to think what it would be like to have sex with a boy. Wouldn't have gone looking for a boy. You must believe me, I couldn't have done that. But that night, I was putting some stuff in the boot of my car. Briefcase, I think, when he came along. Asked me what I was doing. And he saw the football kit in the back and we started talking. He was very forward. And I took him in the car. How did that come about? I just asked him if he wanted to go for a ride, and he got in. And I set off. I had second thoughts even then, but I kept on driving. Went down the Wakefield Road. Turned off, found a country road, and pulled the car off the road and stopped. to talk about. I know, we're doing all right, go on. We got into the back seat and started messing about. He seemed to know what to do, he said he'd been with the lady. I was disgusted with myself. Panicked. And then he said, either you shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have done that, I don't remember which. I was, I was shaking and sweating and he said he'd have to tell his mother and tried to get out of the car. He couldn't. We were miles from anywhere. So I put my arm round his neck to stop him. He was shouting, let me go, let me go, and kicking and screaming. So I grabbed hold of his scarf with my other hand and... and he dropped in front of the seat and went limp. Didn't know if he was dead or not. Couldn't look. Just got in the driver's seat and pointed the car. I just had to get away. The jury believed his story that the death of the boy was not deliberate and he was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to seven years. And the police honoured their pledge to the local homosexual community by burning all the photographs and statements they had taken during their investigations. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.